All right, thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, and I'm, again, I wanted to, just for the cameras, kind of welcome Sarah Gamble here. Um, she is the writer, creator, uh, co-creator, executive producer of the two shows we just watched. My name is Wesley Jackson. I'm the uh, assistant director here at the Carsey Wolf Center. Um, so today, I want to kind of do a couple things with our conversation, just to get kind of a brief history uh, of your kind of connection to these shows and your kind of story with these shows, and then to kind of have a conversation that talks about both the episodes kind of simultaneously and crosses kind of the story worlds between the two shows instead of trying to do them independently. Uh, a couple of topics that I'm hoping we're going to kind of come back to, issues about adaptation, since these are both you know, mm -hmm. stories that came from other source material, uh, how to cre create interest in a show, which is kind of important for the pilot, and then how to sustain that interest, which becomes important for the episode of The Magicians that we saw. Um, talking a little bit about you know, kind of platforms and how platforms have kind of changed for uh, the shows that you've been on in terms mm -hmm. of kind of moving from Lifetime to Netflix, and then sort of collaboration, which seems like a really important part of uh, your history within the industry, and yeah. you collaborate with um, some key people over and over again. But first, to kind of just do some background stuff, just uh, can you give us a little uh, idea of how the Magicians Project arose, um, who were kind of the key figures in helping get that story idea produced uh, for a show, and uh, what was kind of the landscape at Sci-Fi like when you launched that show? Uh, I was just a fan of the books. Amazon, you know when you get the little recommendations when you're looking at a book? It was one of them and I was like, oh, School for Magic. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, add to cart. Um, and I called my agent years and years ago and asked, are the rights available? Probably not, right? And he was like, absolutely not. They're mm -hmm. not available. Huge people are, but you know, this was one of those things where it died and it was, mm. you know, I thought maybe my best shot would be to get on staff of somebody else's version sure, of it. Sure. Then years later, I was in a meeting with John McNamara, who I created the show with, and the producer, Michael London. They were making Trumbo together. Mm -hmm. sure. And um, Michael London, I guess I left the room and he goes, you know, I'm just remembering, I have this book. And so John called me when I was in the car and said, so have you heard of this book, The Magicians? And mm -hmm. I completely freaked out. <laughs> Sure. Um, I was like, I love it. We're doing it. It's like, I don't really like fantasy. Maybe I'll just produce it and you can write it. And I was like, read it and then call me back. Mm -hmm. And then he read it and got to the part where you understand what the beast is mm -hmm. in the book, which sure. is really, I think, if you're reading the book, it's what makes you understand that this is not just a whimsical fairy tale about Harry Potter with sex and drugs. You realize that the, though that's cool too, but um, <laughs> you realize that the monster, the real monsters in the story are humans. Right. And we're, they're using these fantastical ideas. Lev Grossman is using these fantastical ideas to get at something really dark about childhood. Yeah. Um, and then John called me back and said, let's write it together. That's awesome. Yeah. And so were all three of the novels out at that time? Or was it still no. in the process of coming out? Okay. The first two were out, and then we were waiting uh, for, the third. for the third. We one. were bugging him about it a little, just like yeah, we're bugging Caroline now for the next Joe book. Totally reasonable. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about sci-fi? Like what was sci-fi like when you brought them the project? Mm -hmm. You know, what got them excited about it? And uh, what was the landscape like at that, at that network at the time? Right. Sci-fi, S-Y-F-Y, sci-fi. Yes. yes. Uh, we met at the beginning of sort of a new era of sci-fi. They, they will tell you that no matter what network you ever meet at. They'll be like, we're at the beginning of a new regime. Um, but they were interested in um, smart science fiction and fantasy mm -hmm. that was challenging to audiences mm -hmm. and their big sort of sales pitch to us because we had written the script on spec. We just bought the rights to the books. We wrote it in John's garage. Yep. Then we took the script out. And what they said was they were really interested in letting us push the envelope, that mm -hmm. they weren't going to give us a bunch of notes to, to sort of shave the edges down. Sure. Um, and that's what made it an attractive home. An exciting place. Yeah. That's great. And then to switch gears a little bit to, to you, um, mm -hmm. how did that project reach you? Uh, were you actively looking for another project at that time when it sort of got to you? And uh, can you tell us a little bit about kind of its complicated journey to broadcast and then its journey since then, since its premiere? Yeah, this is, it was a weird one. Mm. <laughs> um, we had made the pilot of The Magicians and we were waiting to see if it was picked up to series, which turned out to be a wait of a few months. Mm. And I had... I had met Greg Berlanti years and years before. For anybody who doesn't know, he, if you like a TV show, probably he produces it. <laughs> I think he has something like 22 shows on the air. Mm -hmm. All the superheroes are him, yeah. uh, like, uh, and everything else. It's all him. Um, I had written a script that he was going to produce years before coming off of Supernatural, which is a show I had been on yep. earlier in my career. And it hadn't gone. 
um, if it hadn't been shot. And then he called me and he said, I'm reading this book and it's like binging a crazy TV show and I can't stop talking about it. Um, and I love it so much, I want to find time to write it, but I really would like to write it with a partner. I'd like to write it with you if you like it, which is mm. extremely flattering. Sure. But if you open the book, you, which I recommend, it's a quick read, it's in that second person inner monologue yeah. that we tried to capture for the show. So by page three, you're so deep in his head and you're like, I am just like this guy in yeah. every way. Like, I totally think those things about people. Yeah. It was so seductive. Yeah. It was immediately apparent it should be a TV show. Yeah. yeah. And did you immediately think, were you excited about writing a show that had so much of that interior monologue? Because I know, I mean, one of the kind of rules for writers is write show, don't tell. Yeah. And you're doing all this work where you're writing, you know, uh, the thoughts of somebody and not able to really kind of express those visually on screen all the time. Did mm -hmm. it seem daunting? Did it seem exciting? What is... You know, I was a little snobby about it. Yeah. Like, it's, I think it's a thing that screenwriters say to each other that there's something hacky about voiceover. That's right, yeah, yeah. Um, but first of all, it seemed very necessary hmm. for this story. But I realized that it was a very particular tool because so much of the story of Joe is about how when you're talking to him, he's saying, oh, I like poppy seed bagels too, and we should shazam that song, or whatever. Yeah. And then on the inside, he's like, this person is an this person is a waste of space. And it's so much about the difference between how we present to one another and what we're actually thinking in our heads sure. that it, um, it's a very particular kind of tool. Yeah. Um, it's definitely the most voiceover I've ever worked with, yeah. but I don't, I don't think it really functions the same as it does in other... Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like it functions the same way as it does in the book? Or do you feel like you change the way that that sort of functions? Uh, I, think, I think it does function very similarly. Mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge and the, the, just what was exciting about making the show is that we had to expand the world beyond the inside of Joe's head. Because really, right. you're living so far in Joe's head that it took me a decent amount of time to realize how bad he was. Right. Um, I was on his side because I was in his thoughts. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that the intensity with which he's an unreliable narrator is just mm. greater on the show. Yeah. Where it, it became, by the beginning of season two, it sort of became a mandate for us that we had to figure out how to fool you mm. <laughs> a little bit again. Sure. And, the, and, and like that question always goes back to like, how is Joe fooling himself? Yeah. So I think that it has transformed a little bit as we've been writing the show. That makes sense. To go back a little bit, you talked about how, you know, when you read those first three pages, you're immediately kind of sucked mm -hmm. into Joe's head. Um, again, one of the reasons I wanted to have these two episodes was to talk about the difference between introducing a story world and kind of sustaining a story world. So having watched, you know, the, the pilot episode of you, I'm interested, what did you want the audience to know about Joe and Beck from this episode in particular uh, when you're introducing these new characters? What did you really want the audience to be able to take away from this first 43 minutes? I think it was very important to us that you understand who he really is mm -hmm. by the end of the pilot. Mm -hmm. So we knew that he had to commit an act of extreme violence in the yeah. first 43 minutes. Yeah. So the job of the beginning of the pilot is to lie to you that you're in a romantic comedy like any other romantic comedy. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of it, you're supposed to understand who he really is. Mm -hmm. And we, were, we didn't feel the same responsibility for Beck. Mm -hmm. Really, when you meet Beck, you meet the Beck that he's projecting onto. Sure. Yeah. If you hang with the show for a couple of more episodes, by episode four, we're inside her head as well. Yeah. And at that point, we're starting to kind of take, peel back the layers of um, what, is, what is he ascribing to her versus what is she really doing, which yeah. is often very different. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and that attack that you have at the end of the first episode happens considerably earlier in the narrative of the show than it does in the book, right? Yeah. It takes a little longer for that to come around. So mm -hmm. that seems like a really you know, important decision to show the audience that very, very quickly. We did the same thing on Magicians, actually. In the first episode of Magicians, right. that ends with an attack by a big bad monster called the Beast. Yeah. He's like two thirds of the way through the book, yeah. or at least halfway through the book, but yeah. it has to happen in TV. <laughs> You know, it's like you don't yeah. get an episode two unless the pilot's really good. That's so right. yeah, yeah. a lot of stuff had to be, and it, it makes, it can make an author nervous. I can understand that. Yeah. It feels like you're burning past all of this important stuff. So sure. part of our jobs as the adapters, to skip ahead to yeah. that, no. was to talk the authors in both cases really through the idea that we would loop back and we would pick up some of the stuff we were skipping, yeah. but we really needed the document of the first episode to prove what the series was. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to make that sell with that first episode. That exactly. You picked it up. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so the episode from the Magicians obviously comes from the near the midpoint of the third season. Were you guys so confused? Yeah. It's There's that lot, right? I know. I know. And it I, makes perfect sense if you've seen the other 65 episodes. Or... And, I, I, and I, it was one of the episodes that when I 
when I got in touch with you, uh, you, you kind of suggested a couple of episodes that might be possible ones to show. Yeah. And this was one of the ones you kind of put down as one of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I honestly, I, I showed it to two people who had never seen the show before, and I said, did any of this make sense at all? And they were all like, well, the story between the two guys in the middle was really lovely. <laughs> And everything else was just kind of crazy. And uh -huh. I was like, well, at least there's you know something that we because again I wanted to talk about you know you just you, summarize the magicians. How you just <laughs> oh, no, that's not entirely true. But yeah, yeah. Um, so when you were designing story arcs for a season, mm -hmm. how do you think about sort of the the, the long middle of, of a season or sort of kind of, kind of the act two of the season? Those episodes between say episode three and episode eleven of like right. a thirteen season, uh, a thirteen episode season. What do you want those middle episodes to accomplish? What are your what were your writing goals for this particular episode? You know, I've been in TV for long enough that when I started, I was in Broadcast Network, which is like right. about 22 to 24 episodes a season. Sure. Those middle episodes really are sometimes like, we just got to get through episode 16. Yeah. And um, so let's pick the thing that sucks the least. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just being in a 13 episode order feels luxurious to me. Like we don't have to tread any water. We can burn through story really fast. Sure. My sort of set point yeah. for story is um, excited by these shorter orders. but. I think the particular challenge is different each season. The season that that episode is in has a very um, particular fairy tale structure mm -hmm. where they're on a quest, they have to collect seven keys. Yeah. So you know by the end of the season probably they'll have been on key seven. Mm -hmm. They'll probably have all seven. So the challenge in the writer's room for all of us was to say, how do we mix this up so it doesn't become predictable? Mm -hmm. If in pretty much every episode they show up, they try to get a key, they get a key. And what that ended up doing is um, inspiring the writers to pitch crazier structures. Yeah. And the, we always had that sort of um, feeling that we should see what we can get away with on the show, really. Yeah. And yeah. if it was conventional and had been done before, we were going to throw it out or turn it upside down. But this really made the writers bring their A game. And mm -hmm. I think there's a run of episodes in this season where just a character dies and then you're staying as POV, followed you know, by one where there's two Quentins, and yep. there's just a, a lot in a row. We just stopped saying you have to space those out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that it was in that spirit that the writers in the room pitched. So then in the middle, they get stuck for 50 years. Right. And I was like, so you do a whole lifetime, and then they just die? And they're like, yeah, and then that'll be act two. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. how do you say no to that? Sure. I've never seen it before. And once you have the ability to be like, no, they can mess with time. You know, yeah. like, time is a fungible thing, and we can kind of mess around with it, and mm -hmm. we get the ability to play around with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and, and touching on that, I mean, you, you you add a significant facet to your two main characters. Here. I mean, the one thing that's a little bit risky about doing that is you have two characters that you're kind of walking along in a journey along with everybody else at the same sort of pace and the same rate, mm -hmm. and then you suddenly jump out of that and say, no, these two people have now lived 50 years more than yeah. everybody else around them, and they have the memory of this thing, and that feels like a, a sort of you know, risky thing. So I guess, did that feel like a risk when you were when you were writing about it? Or did you think about how that was going to impact the story as it moved forward? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, does that, does that make some sense? I think that it has to feel like a risk. Yeah. And we feel like that a lot in yeah. the writer's room of that show. And it's sort of the operating principle of the whole endeavor. Hmm. There's really no point in doing another show where beautiful young people discover they can do magic. Sure unless you're gonna push yourself yeah. to discover new human things using those tools. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's like, just rewatch Harry Potter, they're all really great, sure. right? Yeah. Especially the ones with uh, Gary Oldman in them. <laughs> that Quaron awesome. one was really good. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, it's like, there's no, there's, the room is full of people who really love fantasy and science fiction yeah. and grew up feeling that feeling that Quentin talks about a lot on the show where those stories saved them yeah. growing up. Yeah. And so we don't want to be cynical about it. We don't want to keep generating episodes just to generate them. Sure. So when somebody pitches something and everybody's first thought is, well, that's crazy. You can't do that on TV. Then we're like, but we have to then. Right. Let's talk more about it. Take a swing. Yeah. yeah. And so do you remember how this pitch came about or where it came from? Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the film, mm -hmm. but I like sometimes to go on YouTube or is it pronounced Vimeo? Vimeo? I think so. Yeah. Um, and just watch little short films. Sure. And there was a British short film, I think it was nominated for a BAFTA, it might have even won, and it told the story of the relationship between two cops. Mm. Um, and it was all shot directly through the front window of the cop car. And it's so, the only, the scenes begin when they get in and they end when they get out. And it's all the same shot through the window. Mm. And the first scene is this young woman is 
paired with this hardened cop who's really annoyed. And over the course of things, they grow to really care about each other. Mm -hmm. And you see their whole relationship just through this window. Mm -hmm. So I sent it to the writers. And I just said, watch it in the room. It's really cool. And then six or eight months later, Mike Moore, who wrote that episode, yeah. was like, so we were thinking about the cop thing through the window, and what if we did that at the Mosaic and we watched their whole lives play out? So when we first started talking about it with the director, who I feel like might be in the audience somewhere, actually. There, you guys, he directed it. Wasn't it great? That's John Scott. <laughs> He's also, uh, he also directed episode three of season two of You, and we're gonna do, we just, once, I mean, listen, I would be an idiot not to keep working with him. Um, but when we first started talking about it, we even entertained the idea that we would shoot it all one way. So really, they're just moving in and out of the same shot over sure. 50 years. Sure. And that evolved and developed. But there, you, you set up an overhead shot, right? So we were watching them, and then we sp uh, Right. Yeah. 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 You should come up here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well then, I mean, just to talk a little bit about, again, the idea of, you know, Mike wrote this episode, and mm -hmm. talk about, you know, directing and stuff. How do you choose which episodes you want to write within the series? I, I assume you get first dibs on sort of which episodes you want to write. I do get first dibs. Um, so when you're looking at the, the story arc of a season, do you have particular sort of beats that you want to hit in the season, or particular uh, pitches that you feel like are really suited to your writing abilities, or how do you kind of decide which episodes are going to be yours? Well, first of all, when you're, when you're running a show, you're kind of writing everything. Right. You, I, at least, have long since stopped feeling proprietary, or like my name has to be on everything. Sure, because sure. if a script isn't working at a certain point, I'm doing a lot of the rewriting. Yeah. Um, and so the whole, you know, like being a creator of a show is a bit of a title suck. Like they kind of, you get the praise and the blame. So you don't worry too much about that. But a funny thing about TV is that the order is often decided before we know what the episodes are. Certainly that's true for directors. Right. We have to slot them in when they're available, so we actually have no idea mm. what the episode's gonna be, or like if you get the shorts drawn, it's gonna be a seven day episode because we're out of money or whatever. Um, and to a certain extent, that's true of the writers too. Mm. Sometimes we move it around because somebody has a particular affinity. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, this, this past season, um, the season that's currently airing of Magicians, um, we promoted Henry Alonzo Myers to showrunner. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was able to be like, you write the premiere, which is a really hard episode to write mm -hmm. every season. And, yeah. and I got to just sort of sit back and write this emotional episode that aired this week that was entirely just about characters. You shot that one too. Um, but that, so it was a luxury of having a show that has gone on for so long that we have a, a robust writing staff who can handle the pressure. Yeah. yeah. And you've often been on the premiere and the kind of finale of the, mm -hmm. of the seasons, I feel like, uh, on those episodes as a writer. It's yeah. sort of a traditional slot for, the, for creators, or, you know, I'll co-write it with John. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, yeah. the thing about being a showrunner is that so, like, the, if you look at the pie chart of your job, so little of it is writing. Mm -hmm. You're managing so many other things in a day, you don't really get to write as much as you'd like. Yeah. And in a certain way, it's like at the beginning of the season, you have the stamina mm -hmm. to also stay up all night and write the script. Sure. Then at the end of the season, you're like, well, I'll do anything. Let's just sure. get this done. That's <laughs> so that's, that's really my strategy. Yep. Uh, I saw you speak in one interview uh, where you talked about your goal to stay true to sort of epi episode level storytelling. Yeah. And you kind of talked about storytelling, well, every episode feels like its own little bespoke universe. Why do you still kind of uh, adhere to that? And especially since, you know, you moved from Lifetime to Netflix, you now have the ability to release all the episodes all at once. You mm -hmm. don't have those commercial breaks anymore. You have a little bit more flexibility and perhaps in the way that you structure things, but it still feels like season two of you has that same sort of episodic structure mm -hmm. in a way that really kind of still feels like that little bespoke universe. So why do you like that particular style? I just really enjoy, I enjoy feeling I think I'm kind of a structure buff in mm -hmm. a way. And by the way, I didn't start this. I don't know. Are, are there a lot of writers in this audience? Raise your hand if you're a writer. Writers? It's like, it's, yeah, there's, you guys are such writers. You're like, uh, uh. <laughs> yep. When I started, I thought I was bad at structure. Because it's, it's not really a talent. It's a skill. Mm -hmm. I mean, every now and then someone pops out and they're just like immediately writing Agatha Christie novels. But yeah. for the most part, that's just something you practice until you're really great at it. And now that I have a lot of practice at it, I really enjoy the clockwork of how stories work. Mm. And I just think it's such a treat if the season is telling a story and then each episode has its own flavor. Mm -hmm. um, it also makes it easier produ to produce if you're like, well, that one's the acid trip. Mm. Uh, and you just sort of assign 
a central core to it. Mm -hmm. I think it would be easy for um, you know character-driven storytelling to get a little bit sort of flabby if you don't do that, where it's just like, you can't just push the feelings forward. Right. You want stuff to happen to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you can't say in a sentence, well, this is the one where his finger gets chopped off and he has 12 hours to reattach it, yeah. then it's like maybe it's not going to feel urgent enough for people to keep watching it. Yeah. I think that's my fear. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so another thing about kind of the shifting of, of um, you, I mean, I just mentioned it's moved to Netflix. There was that delayed explosion for you, right? You had <laughs> created a show. It had gone on to television. It had not had a huge, huge uh, response. Yeah. Then it gets to Netflix and it becomes this huge explosion. What did that reveal to you about like being a showrunner or about you know the importance of platforms or that it's all arbitrary? We can't control any of it. Yeah. There's no God. No, I don't know. <laughs> it was There's very no weird. Yeah. We were canceled for a whole week. Right. Yeah. 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 And um, and then suddenly. You and the but the room thing. had already started because we first we got an early pickup in the studio, opened the writers room, yeah. and then you know I went and I pitched the season to Lifetime to a very nice audience um, of executives, and then the next day they canceled the show, and I was like, but the room is open. Do I have to tell them? Yeah. I actually didn't for a couple of days tell yeah. them because we were working and sure. the studio was working very very hard to have Netflix pick it up. Uh, Netflix was our partner, so yeah. I had enough confidence in them that I just didn't want that to be hanging over everybody's head like a guillotine. Yeah. But I have always tried to put those thoughts out of my head. Mm. You can't control if something's gonna be popular mm. or zeitgeisty. Sure. The only thing you really have control over is paying very particular attention to what attracts you mm. and what fascinates you. Mm. And I mean, it's just a fact that, I mean, I could go my whole career and write stuff that's interesting to me and it never really hits with an audience. But sure. It's still a much better way to make a living than a lot of other stuff I used to do. Sure, sure. Uh, so, I mean, it's very cool that this happened, but I also was very happy when, you know, we were pulling like the medium water at Comic Con. That was cool too, yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, again, we're talking about production a bit, but um, you have often been writing far away from where you actually shoot, right? Mm -hmm. So, The Magicians has consistently shot in Vancouver. First season of You was shot in New York. Uh, distance has been kind of a consistent part of your show running. But the second season of you is shot in LA. Did that change your relationship to the actual production process and the way in which were you on set a lot more? I mean, did you have more of a kind of, you know, day-to-day -day presence there? No. No. I mean, every again, every producer has a different taste for being on set, but sure. I I usually feel like there are more important places to be as a producer. Mm -hmm. Each writer follows their episode onto set. So when your episode is shooting, you're spending most of your time on set with it. And sure. whether that might mean you get on a plane and it might mean you just drive to downtown LA. Mm. But it's the same with magicians. It was the same when we were in New York. So the most important times for, for the showrunner to be there really are at the beginning of the season. And if there's something particularly difficult or sensitive that's being shot, mm -hmm. I might come up just to support the actors and the director. Sure. Uh, but otherwise, it's sort of like being a showrunner is sort of, it's like you're juggling a lot of weird things all at the same time. And yeah. so, um, you know, if your prep is right, because you usually, if, the, if an episode takes eight days to shoot, you might prep for seven days. You shouldn't waste a second of that time. The director should have asked you a million questions, and you should have bothered the director a million times. Mm -hmm. And you've tried every stunt, and you've checked to make sure the blood is the right color. And if there's a weird lens, you've tested the lens, and you've all agreed we're going to try it. There's, there shouldn't be that many surprises. I mean, there are always surprises, but there shouldn't be that many surprises. Sure. So my attention should then be on the next prep right, at to that walk point. Away yeah. And let the director do the work. Exactly. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, well, speaking of people that you work with and, and trust, um, there's been a lot of collaboration in your career, people that you've worked with consistently. Um, that includes actors, writers, directors, um, in all sorts of different ways. Paco, obviously, from the first mm -hmm. episode, the pilot episode, has just showed up in The Magicians. Um, Joe's bookstore colleague was also in an episode of The Magicians. There's mm -hmm. a number of people from Aquarius who showed up in you. Um, you know, when you're collaborating with somebody on the show, what makes you want to work with them again in the future? And for people who are interested in moving their way into the kind of film industry and the television industry, you know, what sort of behavior should younger uh, filmmakers kind of aspire to hold on to and avoid? I mean, I think the short form is if they're talented yeah. and then not crazy. Not crazy. <laughs> That's a good note, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to work with, you want to work more with people that make it a pleasure, yeah. who are very professional, and I'm happy to say that most of the people that I work with, yeah. I think. The, the truth of the industry 
um, of the TV industry is not like entourage or something. It's a lot of people who are really happy to be there. They're working really hard. Mm. They have a job to do. Mm. They don't have quite enough time to do it usually. And everybody's pretty, pretty cool to yeah. everybody. So um, when you discover an actor who's special, you just want to keep working with them. It's not, it's a, it just felt like a no brainer. And for Luca to be that gifted so young, mm. you know, it's always, there's nothing scarier than when you have to cast a child. Because, yeah. you know, I don't understand how children can be good actors. It seems insane to me. Yeah. Um, it's rare. Most, you know, sitting in those auditions can be a little painful and I feel slightly guilty. <laughs> like they should right. be um, out playing, not right. auditioning for a show. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Luca, who's, you know, and, and um, Jenna Ortega, who is in season two of You, is such an old soul. I mean, she's 16 and she has already shadowed directors. She's done all kinds of stuff. She's going to be running the world Very by sick. the age of 25. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And when you find characters like that, or you find, when you find actors like that, mm -hmm. do you start looking for roles to write for them? Or do you start seeing them in characters that sort of start to pop up? Or how does that sort of, do they just worm their way into your head as a writer and you're like, oh wait, this would be perfect for this person? Or, Sometimes, yeah. but, but oftentimes it's just this little, like an, a character will come up and we'll be like, who could, uh, so Amber Childers who plays Candace. Yeah. She was a Manson girl in Aquarius, which is a show I produced. And she has this very, um, alluring mix of she can seem incredibly sympathetic one second and then the next second you're like wait no she's the bad guy in the horror movie yeah. um, which is her gift as a you know in front of the camera so we it, it's just something in my head said oh the Manson girl should be Candace she should have both things so yeah, yeah it's like a little fun Rolodex which yeah. is an old reference and when you're building yeah, well, I mean, it's, <laughs> um, when you're building a character and you're starting to think about like what are the qualities that they have? I mean, mm -hmm. How much work did you do on like, you know, Joe and Beck to sort of come up with who these people are in terms of their backstory that maybe isn't in Carolyn Kepnes' novel? How much work do you kind of build out for that when you start to write these characters? I, I don't ever sit down and write bios or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I usually discover it as I'm writing the scene over and over. So I, because there's such a a, a technical aspect to a TV script, it really, it has to be six acts long and each act needs to be between, you know, seven and 12 pages, whatever that ends up being. I do much better if I sit down and the plot is outlined. Mm. So I know what he has to do in a scene. And then the, dis the fun discovery part in the script for me is how does he walk to the register and why, where would a gun be and why would a gun be mm. in there? And has he used it before? And the, I just let the question sort of start to pop up organically as I'm writing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that I go, when I'm rewriting, I, I'm pre, I do several passes through before. This is just a little tip <laughs> that I, you know, because I, I, I don't want to burn people out when they're my friends reading scripts. Like, yeah. does this suck? Do you have notes? I want to make sure it's as good as I can possibly make it before I hand it to anyone else. So I do separate passes through to rewrite, looking for separate things. So I'll do a pass to make sure Delilah's plot makes sense. And then mm -hmm. I'll do a pass through to make sure, is Joe as Joey as he can be, mm -hmm. right? And then I'll do like a pass through, I call it the pass for balls. And now I call it the pass for ovaries, where it's just like, am I playing it safe in this scene? Is there something riskier or stranger or more dangerous or more vulnerable yeah. that could be here instead? So I, I just kind of mechanically go through over and over over the course of a few days and just keep rewriting like that. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then you talked a little bit before we came out about the number of passes that each script has to go through. I mean, even once you finish that version, <laughs> then it goes to who? Like, how many people end up reading it? Or how does it kind of make that transition from the first writer who takes the first pass and puts it together mm -hmm. to the point where it becomes a shooting script? OK, literally hundreds of people. Yeah. That's why it's so funny when you get feedback on social media, for example, <laughs> where they're like, did no one read this? It's like literally 500 people read it. <laughs> So the shortest form of this is what I said to you backstage, which is I write for free and I take notes professionally. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I do my pass, then I show it to the producers. Then I show it, if I'm writing the script, right? Then I show it to the whole writing staff. And each of these I show it to is a round of notes and a rewrite, right? And then to the studio, and then to the network, yeah. and then to production. So that, those first several passes are all content does this make sense? I'm confused. Will the audience be confused? Can you do more with Margot? Whatever that is. Yeah. And then as soon as production gets a hold of it, it's 
a centaur will cost $250,000. Um, you know, at what point when you chop the finger off does it become a VFX finger? Mm -hmm. um, or like, we can do this, but then we can't do the other scene because we only, you know, it becomes, your schedule becomes this like vice grip mm -hmm. that the script is being held in where you have to fit as much of the story in as you can in the limited amount of time that you have to shoot it. Yeah, and I guess there's gotta be a balance too between fighting for the things that you really care about in that script and also acknowledging the reality of all the different, you know, voices and needs that go into actually making mm -hmm. the thing. Which I think, you know, even as somebody who spent a lot of time writing academic stuff, you know, the, the moment when you give that thing away and let somebody else start pulling it apart is a really, really hard moment. But it seems like you have to kind of tough yourself out of that if you want to get anywhere close to doing the work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, most of the, well, all of the TV that I've made is fairly modestly budgeted, especially in the era of like Game of Thrones and Euphoria and shows like that that have feature film budgets to make their episodes. Yeah. Um, so I'm very used to, it's, it's actually very clarifying. I think it can be really helpful because the thing that makes your story great is not the spectacle. Mm. That's part of why people tune in and you should have that. Like I want you to have all the candy and I like blowing things up, like I get it. Sure. But the connections have to be deep and the revelations have to, they can't feel like bullshit. Yeah. So there's, it's actually very, I'm sort of secretly grateful even as I'm anxious. When I'm on the phone with a line producer, they're like, this script is $750,000 over budget. And that won't fly. I can't even turn it into the studio. Like they will just throw it back at me. Yeah. Then uh, immediately it's like I see the matrix mm -hmm. and I can start to say, well, I'm not giving that up. Well, that could be, doesn't have to be a party. It could just be they're making a sandwich in their kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's like, it just goes from big to small. Like what's the, could they be in a car? Does the car have to be moving, <laughs> right? Could they yeah, be parked yeah. in a car? Could they be yeah. sitting on the hood of a car? Yeah. Like, can, what if they what if the sun is out? Then we don't need lights. Like I start to yeah. bargain. Yeah. Well, it seems like this is also, <laughs> I've heard you also kind of talk about writer's room as being problem solving spaces. And yeah. this is just what you're doing is like solving all these problems. Okay. Can, can I make this problem a little bit easier? Can I make this, you know, money problem a little bit easier in this way or that way? Yeah. And speaking of, you know, the moment when you give away your work, I mean, you have uh, picked up work from other people, right? You, you are mm -hmm. making both of these worlds within already established structures uh, that exist. Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with the, the creators of these two worlds, the novelists that kind of are behind these two things, and about, you know, when you decide to make the changes that you make, because mm -hmm. both of these uh, properties, you know, are, are both very faithful to the spirit of the uh, original novels, but they both regularly take some pretty large yeah. um, deviations from those stories. Mm -hmm. What motivates those deviations often, and how do those conversations go with the novelist? Uh, I mean, TV is so different than a book. Yeah. It feels great to just be in Joe's head for 300 pages, but you sure. can't really do that. Right. Just the same in The Magicians, there's a whole chapter where they're geese for the whole chapter. It's true. It's really cool, yeah. but we can't afford to have it. Also, like, I think that's boring <laughs> to watch. <laughs> um, so uh, I've learned this. Really, I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Lev Grossman because I learned how to communicate with a, book, a beloved book author by mm -hmm. communicating with him as best I could. And I made mistakes, and I learned from him. He's been very gracious. Yeah. Um, I just say early and often to them, you know, the map is going to look very different at mm -hmm. times because not only are we going to have to externalize a certain amount of what's happening inside your characters on these pages, but to, you know, a scene is not really a scene if there's no conflict in it. Mm. The, if, you, if you have a scene and you're like, what's not working about it? It's like, ask yourself what the problem is. If, they, if, if people are not having a big problem, then, then why would we watch it? Like, yeah. everybody's fine. Yeah. Um, so it means that you have to set characters against each other mm. and have them wanting different things, which just organically means the characters start to be different than they were sometimes in the books, mm. where that might not be as important. Yeah. If you really watch The Magicians, they're a friend group, but they don't like each other. Yeah. Yeah. They, and early in season one, John McNamara and I made it very clear to the writer's room, you are under no obligation to ever make them like each other. Like Penny and Quentin should never like each other. They, they don't have to be friends. Yeah. It makes the story better if Margot just gets to be a bitch to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Always causing conflict. Yeah. Um, kind of along those lines, I mean, again, you've talked a little bit about what's the difference between novels and, and, and shows, but the first season of You and the first season of The Magicians, uh, have a stronger sort of, uh, they're, they're more easily mapped onto the first book, so yeah. of those things. Um, do you find having a book to kind of structure a season to be an easy thing? I think that helps give the structure to the season, or do you find it to be kind of an uncomfortable, you know, uh, jacket that you have to kind of work your way out of? Um, 
Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, I like it. You do. Um, but both of those books, Magicians didn't give us quite as much plot. Mm. It gave us a huge world, though, that was so durable right. and well thought out. And just the way he describes how people do magic with their fingers mm. was his invention, really. Or he was riffing on things he had seen other places. But that's enormous to mm. have that kind of proof of concept on the page where you're just like, so we understand the mechanics of this universe mm. and then and then let's do the greatest hits of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and then Caroline has a background as a TV writer mm. and she was writing more of a thriller, so it is more plot heavy. We actually were fairly faithful, I think, yeah. to the first book. I think so too, yeah. Now we're out of luck. Now you're out of luck. <laughs> she, you ran out of books, you got too fast. Um, we couldn't resist making some of the other characters far worse than they were in the books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and yeah, keep watching. Keep Spoiler watching. alert. <laughs> you take some interesting turns. All right, so we're running short on time. I mm -hmm. do want to ask you a little bit about um, audience stuff as well. You've got two shows that have extremely passionate fan bases mm -hmm. um, who, you know, come to Comic-Con in the case of magicians and, uh, you know, have a very, very vocal uh, social media following in the case of you. Um, they've both, ha at different times, you've had people upset with you on mm -hmm. both shows uh, for different reasons. Um, and I wonder sort of about, you know, when people watch the shows, are you ever surprised with what comes back to you in terms of the way that people are reading the writing that you've put out there? Does it ever kind of shock you uh, what people are kind of getting obsessed with and does that make its way into the writing as you write forward? Uh, I was a little surprised people were that hard on back about the curtains. Mm -hmm. So we did write that into season two. There's yeah. a curtain joke. Yeah. Um, in terms of what people become passionate about or become angry about, yeah. I'm sort of rarely surprised because I go on Twitter and I watch what happens to other shows. And right. I've been doing this for a while now. And I worked for seven seasons on the show Supernatural, which has a famously very vocal fandom. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I kind of feel like it's, it's part of the ecosystem of how television is watched in the 21st century. Yeah. And though sometimes when people are expressing their opinions, it seems personal because it's, you know, like at me sometimes. Um, it's not. It's, it's, um, it's, it's how people express themselves. Uh, and that happens at all levels on the subway, and it happens at all levels on Twitter. Yep. Uh, so, you know, the, I, I do feel like my job has changed a little bit, I will say, in the last few years because there is an inevitability to the idea that if you if you're if you're in a room and all of the writers are holding hands and doing something very personal with their writing and magicians is very personal sure. to all of the writers if you do that for long enough eventually you're going to say something that pisses people off yeah. because you're saying we're not playing it safe we're going there we're saying how we really feel we're doing this thing we really want to do you're going to step on a toe you don't want i mean we're not trying to upset people but it'll happen yeah. i did when i started in this business it was nobody's job to sit writers down and say People are going to say mean things to you on Twitter, right? Yeah. But that's, it's a weird part of being artists who put their work out mm -hmm. in the 21st century, no matter what you're doing, is that people will find you and they will tell you that you are bad and wrong. Yeah. It's very direct. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I actually think we should be doing it. Like, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I, I would think maybe the WGA can start, and the DGA, can start giving little seminars to, to the, what we call baby writers, like starting out in the business, you yeah. know? Someday this is going to come back. So it's just like, here's your best practices people. for when they try to cancel you. There's another, you know, <laughs> sanity-based, you yeah. know, sustenance. So, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we've got a little bit of time for uh, Q&As from the audience. Um, so I was just asking about um, you. So I was going to ask why you chose to name the character Love, like was there kind of a double meaning there? And like when he says certain things, it, it'll have like two meanings. And then um, why did you choose to have him react negatively when he found out that Love was like kind of like similar to him? Uh, she's named Love in the book. Her brother's name is Forty. It's a tennis joke, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Great parents. A lot of people just realized that yeah. and they were like, oh. <laughs> I really like the, 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 I like the fact that he is speaking to love in the lowercase and, and then also in the uppercase. Um, Caroline just is crazy with the names. Mm. Um, and so we just take them and put them on the show. And then in terms of his reaction to the real her, I think 
In the macro, he's somebody who will always be disappointed by the real woman because he's always projecting onto her. He's not trying to fall in love with the real person. He's trying to find a perfect person to just project all of his stuff onto. Um, and she turned out to be perfectly well suited to him in certain ways, but in exactly the ways that he doesn't want to face about himself. So it's great that they're having a baby. Oh my God, huge spoiler alert, but it's been out for a while. Um, so I wanted to talk about, ask about the magicians and sort of, uh, not the casting process, but when Carrie and Laura came up to you with their choices for these super vibrant characters, mm -hmm. how did you know, how did you narrow it down to who you picked? How did you feel that? <laughs> they're, they're amazing casting directors. The casting directors on Magicians cast Mad Men and a bunch of other amazing turn, like these beautiful shows. They, the, the best I can say is they bring this beautiful wide range of possibilities. So like Penny could be this, or Penny could be this, or Penny. And then it's not an intellectual process, really. It's a combination of you feel the character. Like when Hale Appleman walked in the room, we were like, never mind, we're not testing anyone else. Like we had a short list, and then we were like, we have one person, and it's Hale. We just knew the second we saw him. And it wasn't rational, it's just everyone in the room felt the electricity. As you go on, part of that too is this really fun Tetris because it's an ensemble, so it's not just who is Elliot, it's like who is Elliot and Margot together. So you're, st and every, it's kind of fun to be in the room with producers, because Carrie will be like, well, I saw this person do this amazing thing, you know, he was in Mad Men for, like our Josh Hoberman came from Mad Men. Mm -hmm. And so she was just like, just trust me, you know, the sides you see one thing, but he can do a million things. Sometimes it's that, and then sometimes John McNamara will say, well, his energy is very low. And this person's energy is really high, so I really want to see them in a scene together, because that's just how his brain works. We're all trying to get to the same place, which is where is chemistry, but I think each of us thinks of it a little bit differently. So I have two questions. What was the process like casting Penn play Joe and you? And another question is, in season two for the famous acid trip episode, uh, I'm just curious, like, what inspired you guys to depict the trip in that way? Or like, just <laughs> where did you get inspiration from? Okay. So Penn is at a level of being a TV star, and the process is a little different. He doesn't walk in and audition necessarily in a room full of, like he doesn't sit in a waiting room full of guys with dark curly hair, because he's Penn Badgley. It was more of we sat with him and we discussed, and we, you know, he read the script a little bit, but there, you, you pay an extra level of respect when you're dealing with a TV star who has a lot of choices. Um, so that was, a, that was a situation that was much more of a mutual, like, we went right into dating. Mm -hmm. Like, do we have the same values? Do we, are we going the same place? Do we both want children, right? It was me and him and Greg, as most dates should be, right? <laughs> um, and then what was your, oh, the acid trip? Yeah. What was the inspirate? Well, it's interesting when you're trying to express what it feels like to hallucinate it's a little counterintuitive because you would think you just throw the kitchen sink at it and you do a lot of visual effects and everything goes wavy gravy, but that just looks kind of fake and cheap. Sure. So we, what we did was we endeavored to make it feel creepy and uneasy, and that brought us quickly to Kubrick um, and to The Shining because it was in a hotel. There was just something, boop, you know. I, I always think hallucinations are much more effective in a frame on a screen when almost everything looks normal. And then one thing is like doing something David Lynch in the corner that you don't understand and it's scaring you a little. So we, we talked a lot about framing that composition, that very centered composition. And in post, they, they showed me a rough cut where every light had like a rainbow coming off of it. We just took it all off. We didn't need it. Just having a little kid stand there who's not there is actually scarier. Hi, um, so I was wondering, it's, my question is regarding season two of You. Um, so the last two seasons took a different turn than like what I was expecting. And I was just curious if you originally had planned on making a season three or like what, what inspired you to do that? Because the ending was like not expected. I thought it was gonna end at season two. So I was just curious, like what were your thoughts and behind that? I mean, I always brace for cancellation. I never expect that there will be another season. But uh, we, knew, we knew from the very beginning of writing the season that that's where we wanted it to end. So when we auditioned Victoria Pedretti in a chemistry read with Penn, we told Penn that day, 
-hmm. here's the truth of love. And I think told, told Victoria then or soon after, I can't remember. But um, we always knew, I really like, I like it when you watch a TV show and the cliffhanger is so insane, you can't imagine how they're gonna come back from that. That's an amazing place to walk into a writer. So we're, the room for season three of you opens on Monday. And um, they don't know very much. And I know like a little bit of what we're doing. You know, I'm gonna be able to go in and put up like 10 cards for them. But that feeling of, oh my God, we are so fucked, it's a great place to start a writer's room from. Where it's like, oh my God, he's in the hat and she's got the, and like he's not gonna be able to escape that. And oh, he's making such a bad choice with the neighbor. Like everything is terrible. Everything is terrible is the perfect place to write TV from. Like, you'll always come up with something. Yeah. All right, well, please join me in, in thanking Sarah Gamble. Thank you.